morning, church. Glad you are here uh, this morning. We're going to be bouncing around a little bit uh, today, but I want us to open up, if we can, to the book of 2 Samuel uh, chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9, that's where we're going to uh, pull most of our stuff uh, from today. Grateful that if you're uh, here visiting with us, we wanted to call attention again. I know Megan already did, but we have these connection cards. They are there so that you can communicate with us. Uh, fill that out, drop it in the offering plate. Let us know if there's something that you want us to pray for. Um, that gives us the ability to kind of stay connected throughout uh, the week. A couple things. We've got um, a lot of, of good stuff going on. We have a lot of uh, difficulty happening right now. We've got a lot of folks that are, that, are, that are sick. We have some folks that have been uh, dealing with loss of, of friends and um, of parents. Uh, uh, Robert Ekus lost his uh, father this last week. And so it just seems like one of those weeks where it's like the more, you know, it's just, you, it keeps piling on. So I want to encourage us as, as a church to be praying for and with one another. We need to be lifting each other up not just when things are good, but when things are difficult too, when, when folks are really going through it. Because sometimes we just don't know. We don't know what's happening in the lives of the people around us. So we always want to make sure that we're boldly becoming, uh, coming before the throne in order uh, to intercede for people in that way. Also, I want to introduce to you this morning the Tarvins. You guys can stand up. I won't make you come all the way up on the stage. But the Tarvins are here. Everybody say boo. I'm just kidding. Don't say boo. We love them. This is, that's right. We can give them a round of applause. This is, uh, everybody's like, why are we clapping? Uh, this is Bailey and Murrin and their little boy Malachi, and they are going to be running our student ministry uh, from here on out. Praise the Lord. I love you. I love you teenagers. I do. I need a break. I just, I just need a, I need a, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so we're very grateful to have them. Uh, they'll be around after service. Uh, introduce yourself. Actually, Murrin actually graduated from ARAB. Uh, and of course, Bailey has grown up in the area as well. They have been uh, regular attenders and a big part of what's been happening at our Albertville campus uh, for years now. So we're excited to have them here. Please don't scare them away. We love them. We want them to stay. So welcome. We're glad that you guys can be here this morning. I've already put Malachi to sleep this morning, so you know he's getting started on the right foot. Um, 2 Samuel chapter 9. We are starting a brand new series that's called At the Table. And really what, uh, what we were thinking of through this series was to take a little bit of time to remember the fact that God has welcomed us to the table. When we didn't deserve it, right? When we couldn't have earned it, I feel like I'm singing a worship song, right? When we, when we didn't earn it and we couldn't possibly have deserved it, God reached down to us and welcomed us to his table, a table that we are powerless to reach on our own, yet he did. And so what we wanted to do is to look and say, how can we begin to view those around us who have a seat at our table? What do I mean by that? Obviously, we're moving towards Thanksgiving, so we're going to talk about food, right? Woo, woo, glorious. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for all of that, but more than that, it's about relationships. It's about who are those people that we allow into our circles, not only allow, but that we invite. Are there people that we go out of our way to invite to be a part of community with us? You know, the Around the table is where relationships kind of happen, right? It, even if it's just, hey, let's go for a, a cup of coffee or something. You usually are sitting at a, at a table or you invite somebody over for dinner and there's a, there's a warmth with that. There's a welcoming with that. And that's not just our culture, right? That's, that spans cultures. People who share food with one another, not always over a table, depending upon what culture it is, right? But that who share those opportunities with each other and invite them into the, the most intimate parts of their lives. And that's where real community begins, where grief is shared. You know, so often I have found that folks who are walking through periods of grief, and we've lived this, you know, I've lived this in my life, that the, the most, the greatest blessing outside of my relationship with the Lord in those moments are the people that I've invited to the table who end up being more of a blessing to me than I ever could have been to them. Our table is an important place. And what we want to do with this series is ask that question, who has a seat 
at your table. And maybe by the end of the sermon series, just four weeks, maybe we've found that we've expanded that circle a little bit in a good way, right? That we've started to include people at our table that maybe we haven't in the past. And so we are going to talk uh, about a story in scripture and a person whose name I always have trouble saying. Um, so we're going we're gonna to try. I'm going to mess it up a hundred times today, uh, but we're still, we're still going to talk about, uh, about <laughs> Mephibosheth. It's a really hard word for me to say for some reason. And it's one of those words where if you mess up, you feel like you're going to get in trouble, you know, like your mom's going to yell at you. I'm like, no, it's, but I, it's, it's just hard to say. There's too many fs and sh- z- 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 that kind of stuff in there. And I just can't, I can't always pronounce it. But there's a, in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 9, we're going to read 1 through 13. It just kind of gives us an overview of what we're going to be talking about. So 2 Samuel chapter 9, uh, verse 1. And David said, is there still anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? We'll go through some of these characters in just a second. Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David uh, and the king said to him, uh, are you Ziba? He said, I am your servant. And the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in his feet. The king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, he is in the house of Meshir, the son of Amiel, at Lo Bador, Lo Debar, excuse me. Then King David said, uh, sent and brought him from the house of Meshir and the son of Amiel uh, at Lo Debar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, uh, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face, paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of of your father Jonathan, and I will restore you all the land of Saul, your father, and, all, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, what's your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, all that belonged to Saul and to all of his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the, till, till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's son. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servant. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for the opportunity to look into your word. Thank you uh, for a chance to look at mercy, to look at grace, and to see um, that this is a shadow of all the things that Jesus has done uh, for us. I pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds, so that we'd hear your truth, that we'd apply it in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. So I'm not going to say his name again unless I absolutely have to. Sorry? All right? We'll call him Eminem from now on. No. This is a really interesting uh, story because what's, what's happened here, and, and if you know uh, about the history of the nation of, of Israel, Saul was the first king of Israel, and God never really intended for there to be a king, but the people were like, everybody else has a king, we want a king, and God's like, that's not how, we, how we're going to do this, but then finally he said, okay, I'll give you a king, and Saul started out as a really good king. He, was, he, he did a good job, and then, like many of us, got distracted and started walking a different road and ends up really being a hindrance to the nation of Israel. And that's when we know that God chooses David, the youngest son of, of Jesse, right? We know that whole story. This is the same, same David, David and Goliath, right? Same guy, same dude, King David. 
he's chosen, but Saul, of course, doesn't want to recognize him, so, so uh, David has to run, has to leave. But through this period, he's still very close friends with Jonathan, who is Saul's son. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic because there's his enemy being Saul, but David doesn't have any animosity towards him, and Jonathan is still taking care of him. Jonathan shows him great kindness through this time. So long story short, lots of things happen that we don't have time to get to this morning, uh, but a lot of things happen, and Saul and, and uh, Jonathan have passed away. And so David is now seated at rightly as king. Now you see, in these types of cultures, what would happen, especially when the, uh, when the kinghood would pass between families, Oftentimes what would happen is everybody that was in the previous royal family, they were either sent away or they were sent away, right, to a farm to live happily somewhere. No, right? right there were, they, because nobody, none of the kings wanted anybody to have a right to stand up and say, no, I should be, I should be. And so what's happened here is, is when, when this occurs and Saul and Jonathan pass away, uh, Mephibosheth's um, nurse take, grabs him and runs with him because she doesn't want him to be killed. And actually what happens is she, she drops him. He's, he's young at this point. Uh, and, it, and it breaks his legs and he actually ends up being a cripple for his whole life uh, because of this. But he goes into hiding. So he's injured, goes into hiding. He lives in exile. He is landless. He is powerless. There is no, this guy has no real legitimate claim to the throne of David. Like he could if he really wanted to, but let's be honest. What's he gonna bring to the table? Not a whole lot, pun intended, right? He's not doing anything for David. David has no reason and no need to reach out to him. But as we read here, David has a desire to show kindness because of the kindness that was shown to him by Jonathan. That's really important. It's important for us to begin to realize that, that we can love, we can show mercy because we've been loved and we have been shown mercy. It's not natural for us to do on our own, but because of what Christ has done for us, we have the ability to step out and to do that. So we see that David invites him to his table, not just to his table, but gives him back all of his land, gives him back everything that he had lost, and then said, not only that, but you're going to be able to eat at my, at my table forever. In essence, adopting him as, as, a, as another son. So there's a lot of great lessons from these stories. If you have the outline that you were given when you walk through the door, um, you'll be able to follow with that, or you can go to your U version. Um, live events on the Bible app, put in 35016. If you don't have your location turned on, that will bring up uh, the notes so that you can follow along. So much of this is such a beautiful picture of what Jesus has done for us. So I don't want us to miss that, but I do want us to be able to get all the way through it. There's lessons that we can learn from this story. Number one, we see that there is a show of unmerited mercy. What does unmerited mean? Anybody know? Undeserved, very good, right? Unearned, very well, very good. Yes, this un, it's, so there's nothing that we deserved about it. We never earned it, and yet it's something that has been given to us. Mercy is a really interesting thing because mercy is, is us not getting what we do deserve. That's a word we use a lot in my house, okay? Uh, we've got two kids, uh, 10 and under, and uh, so we try to show a lot of mercy, uh, and they're in need of a lot of mercy. Let's just be, let's just be honest about it, right? We get the parents in the room, amen. We got to come and say, no, look, I'm going to show you mercy and I'm not going to give you the consequence, another word we use a lot in our house, that you deserve because I'm going to show you mercy. James 2.13, you don't have to turn there, but reminds us that mercy triumphs over judgment. Another really famous story in, in Luke chapter 15 is the story of the prodigal son, right? The son who says to his dad, hey, I'm gonna get out of here, but I want you to give me, I want you to give me my inheritance now, 
which you can tell this is a completely different culture because I can tell you how good that would go over if I said that to my father uh, at this point. You know, hey, hey, give me what I'm going to get when you die because I want to go off and do my stuff. So then he does. Uh, the father gives him his inheritance and he goes and he uh, wastes it and lives lavishly and does all the things that he shouldn't be doing and then finds himself shortly thereafter penniless and without a hope or anything. So he's actually working for someone else feeding their pigs. And he says that the, the slop that he's giving the pigs actually starts to make him hungry. That's when you know you're really hungry, right? And he's like, man, what am I doing? The servants at my parents, at my father's house, they eat better than this. I'm gonna go back to my dad. I'm gonna tell him that I've sinned against him. I'm gonna apologize. And I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm gonna ask to be a servant in his house. And uh, Luke 15, 20 through 21 says this, and he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. You see this picture again of this unmerited mercy because really what the son deserved was to be right in the situation he was in. He made the bad decisions. He spent the money the way that he shouldn't have. He deserved everything that he got and really more. And yet, the father loves him so much that he runs to him, embraces him while he's still a long way off, the Bible says, and brings him back in. We know the rest of that story, right? Not just as a servant, but back as a son. He, he puts kills the fatted calf for him and puts robes on him and says, no, you were, you were lost, but now you're, now you're back. This is how God celebrates us through unmerited mercy. I think for us, we need to remember that we don't get what we deserve and we should be really grateful for that <laughs> because what we deserve is the consequences of our sins separating us from God, separating us in relationship and separating us separating us from him for eternity. David has every right to leave Mephibosheth in exile or to do worse, but he doesn't. He extends this mercy not on the merits of Mephibosheth, but because of the love that he received from Jonathan. We can then extend mercy not on the merits of the people that we're giving mercy to, but because God has been merciful to us. Has anyone ever done that? Like had an opportunity maybe to show forgiveness or show mercy and been like, they don't deserve it. <laughs> I have, I'll raise my hand because I've definitely done it. You know, like, they don't deserve it. And I'm 100% right, they don't deserve it. But neither did I. And what makes amazing grace so amazing is that God's still willing to give it to us through mercy. We can show it because we have been shown. Number two is this. We see an example of extraordinary inclusion. Extraordinary inclusion. Now listen, I may, I may use that word. It's a buzzword, right, in our culture now. Now all of a sudden, alarms start going off. I'm like, wait, what are we talking about here? What direction are we going David uh, chooses from a position of power to extend his mercy and his love to someone who is powerless. There isn't any logical, political reason for David to do this. He just invites Mephibosheth into this state of blessing. Inclusion is always risky. What do I mean by that, right? We, we know that there's always a risk associated with reaching out to someone. And inclusion in all, our culture has now been used as a cinnamon, synonym, not cinnamon, although I like cinnamon too, as a cinnamon, synonym, but, but, but you know what I'm saying. The same thing, right, as acceptance or affirmation of a position, we feel now that when we include, that that means that now I'm affirming all of the positions and all of the ideas that this person holds, when the reality is that we can and should include people at our table that we disagree with politically, religiously, and philosophically. What? 
Yes, that's right. We should. That's what Jesus did. This is why Jesus was always getting himself in trouble. Look who he eats with, right? Look, he's having meals with the sinners and the tax collectors and the prostitutes. He didn't didn't agree with all of the things those people were doing, and yet he invited them to the table. It's so important for us to get past some of those sticking points and to be able to say, what is more important? I want to show love like I've been loved. I want to show mercy and grace like I have been shown mercy and grace. Our understanding of inclusion needs to change. You can't share the gospel with people who don't believe if you don't surround yourself with anybody who doesn't believe. I wish I had like a, like a, a record scratching, right, at that moment. That's because here's what we do. We surround ourselves with people that we're comfortable with, and, and we kind of get in that echo chamber. And look, don't get me wrong. We've talked about this a bunch Strong biblical community absolutely should be made up of those who know Christ and can lift us up and we can lift each other up in Jesus, no question. But if we're, not, if we're not allowing ourselves to come into the circles and into the lives of people who are far from God, how are we gonna share the gospel? Evangelism, I heard it um, defined like this. It's, it's just one um, beggar telling another beggar where they can go for bread, right? Who are we telling? Do we, have that, do we have that opportunity to be able to share with someone? And if we don't, maybe the problem is that we're not inviting all the right people to our table. Not all the time, not in all situations, I get it. But there are opportunities for us to be inclusive because I'll tell you, one of the things that the church gets lambasted with a lot, which isn't always necessarily true, is that they're not very inclusive. Jesus was ridiculously, extraordinarily inclusive to the place where people wanted to kill him for it. That's the kind of inclusion we're talking about. Not affirmation, inclusion. Who can I bring into my circle so that I can continue to share the gospel with them. Number three, it's the last one this morning. There's a reflection of unmerited grace. Look, we've talked about unmerited mercy, right? Where you don't receive the justice that you deserve. Then there's grace, the opposite side of that coin. That's when you do receive the blessing that you didn't earn. And God gives us both. He not only takes away this uh, separation from God for all of eternity, he gives us new life. He gives us relationship with the Father. He gives us uh, the uh, be calling us sons and daughters of God and changing our stature with him. You see, The whole point as we read through this is Mephibosheth never deserved it, couldn't have earned it. There was no reason for David to do it. But because of mercy and inclusion and grace, you see David step out and speak truth in life, completely and totally changing this guy's future. Obviously, we've talked a lot about how this is a picture. There's a deeper meaning. I want to read to you from Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. It says, while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died, died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Unmerited grace, extraordinary inclusion, and ridiculous mercy make a lot more sense if you know the God of Romans 5, 6 through 8. Because otherwise it doesn't make any sense at all. So why would I do that? Why would we do that? Because while we were still sinners, 
not good, not worthy, Christ died for us. And then called us and said, hey, go and make disciples. Go and show love, grace, mercy, inclusion in a way that's going to bring people to the table. Not just so that we can feed people, which is awesome. We want to feed people when we have that opportunity. Not just so we can provide community, which is awesome. We want to do that when we can, but so that we can share the eternity-changing truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. His death, his burial, his resurrection. The only way that we are led to new life is through that. So if we don't do anything else, we need to take those opportunities to be able to say, this is the truth, and the truth will set you free. And the, one of the best ways that I have seen to do that is to start to invite people in close community with you, invite people to your table. Let's bow our heads this morning. As we begin this series, my challenge for us is to see how uncomfortable we can make ourselves. Not just for the sake of being uncomfortable, but because God is always, when we're pushed outside of our comfort zone is where we see God do these amazing things. And I'm with you, you know, sometimes it's like, I just, I'm happy with the people at my table, <laughs> you know? It reminds me of a wedding. I'm always like, what table are they gonna put me at? I'm very concerned about who's gonna be at my table at a wedding. But you know, there's, there's more opportunities to begin to have conversations with people that might be in need. Maybe, it's, maybe they're Christians and they're just in spiritual need and they need someone that's gonna speak truth and love and life into their situations. Maybe it's somebody far from God and they need to hear the gospel. Maybe you're the one that God wants to bless from expanding your table and inviting more people into that circle. This is my challenge as we begin to move through this relationship series. We're gonna talk about all sorts of different relationships. This is one of the, the ways that we really felt introducing this series because there's so many people at our table, right? Sometimes it's friends, sometimes it's strangers, sometimes it's family, sometimes it's enemies. And God gives us specific ways to deal in all of these circumstances, but it's always led by love. So every head's bowed, every eye's closed this morning. Maybe you would say, Pastor, I hear what you're saying. I struggle. I struggle when it comes to opening my table, not because of selfishness, but because of fear. And I, what, what I would like you to pray for is that God would broaden my horizons, that he would expand my scope of influence, and that I would be willing to invite more people to the table. If that's you this morning, no one's looking around, just pop your hand up, amen. All over, I see him. Maybe this morning you would say, part of my hesitation is that I don't feel like I have ever responded to God's invitation to be at his table. There hasn't been a time or a place where I've trusted in what Jesus has done and ask for forgiveness of my sins. If you're at home watching this afterwards, if you're here in this place, nobody's looking around. If you say, that's me, all I wanna do is pray for you. I'm not gonna call you out. I'm not gonna have you come forward. I'm just gonna pray and invite you to pray with me. But if that's you this morning, you say, you know what? I haven't trusted Jesus as my savior, but I wanna do that. Just pop your hand up real fast. I promise I'll see you. Amen. Now more, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have this opportunity. I'm gonna pray right where you're seated. You can pray in your heart. You can pray out loud, however you want to do that. If you're at home, it's not a magical prayer. It's just what the Bible says, that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So something like this, you could pray along with me. Jesus, I believe that you are God, that you died on the cross for me, but that you rose again in victory. And I pray this morning that you would take my sin away, that you would forgive me. 
and that I wouldn't just serve you as my Savior, but that I would follow you as my Lord. Help me to make wise decisions and to trust in you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here this morning and that's the first time you've prayed that prayer, let us know so we can connect with you and give you next steps. I want to pray for all of us who raised our hand before that. Maybe fear is stopping us from expanding our table. Let me pray for us before we sing this morning. Jesus, for all of us who have a tendency to pull back sometimes because we're afraid, maybe we're afraid of letting people in because we don't want to be hurt, God, I pray that you would help to expand our influence, help us to see the opportunities that you have given us to invite more people to the table, whether that's family, whether it's friends, whether it's strangers, or even those that we would consider to be our enemy. Because we know that you love all of us with the never-ending love that is shown through Jesus and given to us freely through the truth of the gospel. So God, help that to be our motivation. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. In Jesus' name. Go ahead and stand with us as we sing.